Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Let's talk about your psychology, the issues you are going through, the pain you are going through, your anxiety, depression, isolation. Have you not had an honest conversation with somebody perhaps for your entire life? Do you even know how to be friends with somebody? Do you even know how to have like a mutual ex exchange of, of emotional resources without you know, doing it in a healthy way, without feeling weak, without feeling drained all the time? You call yourself an introvert. Are you even an introvert? You don't even know. You don't even know what emotions are and how to talk. How can you d decide whether you're an introvert or extrovert or, or whether there is a distinction between those two in the first place? How can you decide what you are, what your personality is when you're lugging around all this pain? You know, as much as I know about psychology and as much as I think I can help you here manage your issues, and I think I can. I mean, I know I can. There are still some things that, that never cease to amaze me. How much pain people are willing to to under, endure, to put themselves through. And, and I include myself in this. I'm not just talking to you plebes out there who, who endure pain. You don't deal with the pain. You simply endure it. You sit with it. You don't do it. You just you lug it around. And, you, and after a while, you, you don't even think it's abnormal anymore. You think this is simply how existence feels. It's not existence. It's your psychological issues. And then you think all these things are against you, you know, whether it's the government or the the boss, or you know, it's all you. It's all you and your man and and your inability to manage issues or the issues that you project out. But it just it feels like reality. And you can't make decisions that you can't make the decisions you want to make. You may have so much anxiety. <laughs> you may have so much anxiety that you'll start to think that Sam Harris's arguments against free will make a lot of sense because that's how you feel. You feel like you don't have any choice and you may not have a choice. Let's manage your issues, free up some of that willpower so you can begin to make decisions that you want to make. Begin to make a decision that you could have made otherwise. But yeah, we're just willing to, to endure pain. It's amazing. And you really don't know how bad it is until you get to the end of it. And then you look back and realize, oh my God, I, you know, I was, I was running at half capacity because <laughs> I was lugging around all this pain and then something would happen and I, I'd have a painful reaction, right? I would be triggered by something that happened. And I figured I just had an inability to deal with pain or I was really sensitive. Well, you weren't sensitive. You weren't sensitive enough. That was the problem. You weren't sensitive enough with the pain that you were dealing with. Inability to get your own needs, inability to manage anger in a healthy way. That's part of this. And so when just one thing happened, right, the straw feather that broke the candle's back, you know, whatever the saying is, and you, and you think you, you can't deal with the feather. No, it's, there was a lot on there already that you couldn't manage. So let's teach you how to manage your issues uh, specifically today. I've got some questions here. So we're really going to be talking about you. Uh, and this is it for questions, by the way. i got three questions here. This is it for this show. So... Animus at AdminsEmpire.com if you guys have any more questions. This first one is from a listener who uh, thinks she may be a bad person because she doesn't really care about all the people dying from COVID. 250,000, 300,000, whatever it is at this point. Is it really caused by COVID? I'm not saying COVID isn't real. Of course it's real. But are all the deaths legitimately caused by COVID? I wonder. That is what you call an opinion. Whenever I talk about uh, anything outside psychology or even in philosophy... It is an opinion. When I talk about psychology and philosophy, I know what I'm talking about. But outside, it may be an opinion, which I may be correct about. I wonder if everybody who is supposedly dying from COVID really died from COVID. I know they had COVID when they died. <laughs> Let's talk about this, though. Yeah, so I think what this listener is dealing with is this very human phenomenon that Jung talks about, you know, theorizing about schizophrenia and then seeing it in the clinic dementia praecox we are not really tuned into something unless we see it so if there's just one person who dies of this one disease then what happens right? we, we put their photo up on, on the news article we can see them we can say more about their story if we just see that number 250,000 300,000 it doesn't really mean that much to us Stalin had that saying a single death is a tragedy uh, a million deaths is a statistic and what he's talking about here is, it's almost like, I mean, some evolutionary psychologists would make the argument, we just lack that ability to wrap our minds around that. You know, I'd like, I, I can, you know, go to the planetarium 
and see a video about the vastness of the space. And I get it. I, I get what a light year is. You know, it, it all make it right. It makes sense. Right? I, I can do the math, but there's a part of it I, I simply cannot wrap my mind around. I think it's the same thing with, um, hmm, I guess, dealing with our psychology. I mean, it, it just seems really complex. We have to come up with these concepts that we can't really wrap our I mean, I talk about anxiety, what it is, how it relates to your decisions, um, the, the result of not managing your anxiety well, you know, how that manifests in your life. And that all makes sense, but it's not really what anxiety is. It's just a representation. It's a concept. It's an abstraction that we can use to understand anxiety. And um, a million deaths, that's just an um, abstraction. 300,000 COVID deaths, it's simply an abstraction. Um, and there's actually a synchronicity here. I just came across a, a research article that, that showed exactly this. It showed what we already know. That's that's what the best research does. And so typically in psychology nowadays is it shows us what we already know, but it kind of does it in a cool way and it tracked comments on different news stories. One of them was about a bunch of deaths and one of them was about one death in particular and the comments that were on uh, the stories about the one death in particular were, were more emotive, more empathic. There's more affect to the words. I don't know exactly how they measured it. Um, but yeah, you know, Jung talks about this in um, ab yeah, the, the importance of ab reaction in therapy. So not only when you go to therapy, you, you, you do a confession. That's part of therapy, which is what the Catholic Church gets right. Confession, to quote Jung, is how you throw yourselves into the arms of humanity. Be, be welcome back in the flock, so to speak. You're part of a flock, but you're also an individual in that flock. That's what individuation is. It's not just standing outside of other people like Zarathustra, you know, coming down from the mountaintop, looking down on the plebes. It's, yeah, there's a lot of ways that I'm uh, like other people, but there's also, in those ways, I, I can also be different. Right? I understand how I am a human, but how I can use my human attributes to create my own personality. There's two sides of individuation. Um, and yeah, this is what Jung talks about. Um, so when you have an ab reaction, what you're doing in a sense is, yeah, so you're not just going to therapy for confession, you're going to have emotional experiences. An emotional experience with yourself, an emotional experience that, that you would have if it was just a story of one person. Right? You, and, and that's where the connection comes in, that's why I talk about the importance of group a lot, is you see yourself, you, you make yourself conscious by seeing yourself in somebody else, in somebody else's experience, especially when that person on the surface may have a very different life than you have. But you can recognize, man, on, on some level, we're, we're going through the same thing emotionally. And uh, that's really what you're doing when, when you're seeing a new story of one death as opposed to 100,000 or 300,000 or a million, as Stalin says. Um, yeah, this, this also reminds me of this exhibit or an installation. I don't know if it's a permanent installation, but it's at MoMA. Um, you know, you read about the 55,000 American deaths in Vietnam and yeah, I mean, that's kind of a lot, but it's still just a number, but there's this uh, art exhibit there that actually just goes through the faces of every American who died in Vietnam. And, and it just makes that number so much more evocative. But it, again, I, I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with you, listener. That nothing wrong with you at all. This is how we all are. Of course. Yeah, you don't care. You, you don't have the capacity to care. You don't have the the uh, capacity to really understand what a nebula is or really put that, right, a nebula, it's nebulous. You don't you can't really put that in your mind and, and, wrap, and wrap your mind around it. Just like you can't wrap your mind around 300,000 people dying from COVID, allegedly. Or how many people died of, of you know, to go back to Stalin, of communism. But I think this is an indication of what's important in therapy and, and what we need to go through. We need to have that kind of one-on-one -on -one experience, not just with somebody else, but with ourselves, right? This is about having sympathy for what you're going through, relating to what you're going through, and not just getting it intellectually. Any idiot can understand psychology intellectually. Look at most psychologists. They're not too intelligent. Um, but yeah, you know, this is why you cannot be conscious in a vacuum. The 300,000 COVID deaths, that's just some vacuum. Putting a face right there, that makes it more real. Um, 
like those uh, Sarah McLaughlin ASPCA commercials, right? They can't just tell you that dogs are abused. They have to play that sad music and show you what an abused dog looks like. That's what means something to you. Um, you know, I think if anything, right? right? Okay, so <clears throat> yeah, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic, but there's a decision behind those million deaths. And I think that when you really understand that decision, that's what begins to um, make it a tragedy. And I think the real tragic thing here with COVID isn't that people are dying. That is a tragedy, but it's really exposing our inability to react to these things or, or inability to manage um, a sort of pandemic to whatever extent or, or to however serious the pandemic is. We, we simply just lack the resources to manage it, emotional resources too. You know, what bothers me more, I, I know this This makes me sound um, cold and heartless, but, uh, you know, this is just how we are. You know, what bothers me more than the 300,000 American deaths is the fact that I can't get nice uh, paper towels. Right? I mean, that personally, that bothers me more on a visceral level. Um, because people are, are going insane and there's this new shortage now, paper towels around here, there was. I mean, I get really crappy paper towels. You can't, you can't microwave bacon on crappy paper towels. It, uh, like some of the paper towel comes out from the bacon. You're, you're, you're sitting there eating the bacon. You're in effect eating the paper towel as well. Uh, good roughage, I guess. But in a way that bothers me more because it's visceral and it's right there and it's real. Um, but it's not just that. It's what this means about America. It, what this means about our ability to manage, you know, any sort of emergency situation. We can't. We freak out and everything gets worse each emergency we go through. Same thing happened in 9-11. 9-11 is terrible. It's, it's awful, right? But our reaction to that indicates way more about our, the, our direction as a country than 9-11 ever could. Your girlfriend breaks up with you, like, like that example. It, all, it happens. But your reaction to it says more about where you're going to be in 30 years than the girlfriend breaking up with you, about where you're going to be in one year. I mean, even one month, right? You know, what's important here? Bad things happen, pandemics happen, natural disasters happen. How do we react? And I think we, it's, we can't care about the death so much because we see so many other systemic problems. I know that's a word the left uses a lot. So many systemic problems that... It just doesn't seem like we're going to be able to manage, you know, which is fine. This is what happens in most civilizations. We cannot balkanize soon enough, but yeah, no, you're not, you're not a bad person. I may be a bad person for caring more about my paper towels, but you're not a bad person for caring more about one dev as opposed to a million. So it's Stalin recognized. And that's why, we, you know, these tyrants are able to get away with the atrocities that they do. Um, okay. And next question, uh, can I talk more about what it means to get needs met in a win-win game theory? So this is from the listener who asked the question. I don't know if you guys remember, but uh, did I just say acts? I mean, I'm watching too much Futurama. Um, that who asked a question <laughs> a couple, maybe about a month ago or so about the guy like, what does it mean to get your needs met? We talk about that a lot on the show. What does it mean to get your needs met? What even are your needs? She gives this example of this guy whose girlfriend was murdered and he had to go identify the body. He didn't want to, but he did identify the body that, you know, that we, we could see in the service that wasn't a need of his, but he did identify the body because if he didn't, then either his girlfriend's mom or sister would. And he wanted to spare them the pain of having to identify the body. So he went and identified the body, even though he didn't want to. He, on the surface, you could say he wasn't looking at his own needs, and in fact, he sacrificed his own need for the needs of the group, which I would say on the surface of it, or what, what really happens there is that's unhealthy. It's unhealthy to do that, to sacrifice yourself for other people, sacrifice your own needs for other people. Yet, I would agree that what he did there was the right thing to do. So how do we clear out some of this confusion between doing what you need to do and maybe doing what you want to do? So we could say another way of framing it, I think it would be incorrect. What he really wanted to do 
again, I think this is incorrect, but we could say what he really wanted to do is not identify the body, but what he needed to do is identify the body to spare his, um, the, or his girlfriend's sister and mom. Uh, I think what is going on here is, um, it's not a question, okay, so let me just say it this way. It's not a question of sublimating your individual needs for the needs of the group. That's what it looks like on the surface. And that's how a lot of people, when they're you know philosophically obtuse, that's how they, they will frame it. And then people will start to think, you know, which isn't bad, you know, if, if you just frame it in the, this situation in this context, you end up being correct. Uh, but what happens is when you start to apply that principle to other situations, and then you get this idea that men, it's noble for men, or especially masculine men, to sacrifice yourself for others. Which again, may be a very helpful rule or code of ethic in certain situations. But in other situations, you're going to end up turning in your own needs, and you're going to uh, yeah end up being you know effectively the this is fine dog, you know, with the the coffee and the fire, you know, my favorite meat. You end up being that, which means you can't manage your anger very well, which means there's a lot of anxiety around your anger, which means you're decidedly less masculine. I think the way to, to think about this isn't your individual needs versus group needs, isn't you need to sacrifice yourself for the group. The way to think about this, the way to think about needs is what is the intention behind it? To go back to that, is it to increase pleasure Pleasure, there's, you know, that's a loaded word. It, it implies short-term gain. I, I just mean overall happiness, even deeper than happiness, satisfaction, right? It's not enough to be happy. We must be satisfied with ourselves. To quote Jean Valjean, I'm finishing up uh, reading Les Miserables again. Yeah, so it's, are, are you increasing satisfaction with yourself? I guess that's another way of saying it. Or decreasing pain. Now let's go to the example of this guy who needs to identify the body of his dead girlfriend. Um, what would he do? What would it mean for him to avoid that situation? Is he pursuing pleasure? Is he uh, developing a greater sense of satisfaction with himself in life? Or is he avoiding pain? Clearly there he is avoiding pain. And he would realize this the next morning he wakes up and he, and he, yeah, and he thinks, man, I wussed out in a sense and now uh, my my girlfriend's uh, uh, mother and, and sister had, had to deal uh, with the, the gruesomeness that comes from identifying the body. You know, he, he feels awful. Um, so you may not know what you need to, or yeah, you may not know what is an increase of pleasure and decrease of pain in the moment. He may think he's increasing pleasure, increasing satisfaction, but eventually you know. And this is how you figure out. It's okay. This is how you develop intuition. So if there's ever a question, you know, just don't come to a, a, a decision and, and simply not make it because then you don't learn anything. But it comes down to, yeah, are you doing what's objectively good for you? I know we're talking about objective values. Oh, you know, you can't do this. Everything's subjective. It's all your perspective. No, there are things that are good for you, not absolute, but given your situation, given the context of your life, there are things that are simply going to be better for you. Another way of thinking about this is in the um, context of initiation. So this listener has a, another question on, on the same topic. She was uh, re-watching Stranger Things, and I guess there's a a point in the end where Eleven needs to decide between going back with her mother and saving her friends from the Demogorgon. Again, same kind of, of decision there that the the guy who's going through had to identify his girlfriend's body. You know, part of you wants to oh just go live with your mom. Oh, you know that's safe. That's nice. You 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 know especially in the case of Eleven, she hasn't lived with her mom. That's what she was going after the whole first season, if I recall. So the choice between that and saving her friends. Now you could say in a sense, again, that Eleven in a, sacrificed her need for the need of the group. Really what is going on is Eleven made the mature decision to um, not simply avoid pain, right? Going back to the mom, you know, this is what we talk about in our Symbols of Transformation episode, going back to the mom 
uh, is in the, to the mother is regression. That is avoidance of pain. That is the root of the, I mean, that's the Oedipus complex and it's the root of the op opioid epidemic in America. You know, getting addicted to this comfort, this sickly comforting uh, feeling that we get when we're around our mom and we're in comforting situations, which is fine to regress, but when you stay there, like that was, I think, Eleven's choice, she was just going to stay there, not go to her friends and, and save the Demogorgon, or save her friends from the Demogorgon, then, yeah, that, that, that would be the avoidance of pain, not the pursuit of pleasure. And here, what Eleven is going through is specifically an initiation, right? The separation from the parents, exactly what I talked about. What are the stages of adult development? It goes from parents to friends, or parents, a solid, uh, yeah, solitariness, and then to friends. What Eleven is doing is, is growing up, in a sense. She is sacrificing her, quote, need to be around her mom for her friends. And she's taking her libido from, uh, the, you know, being comforted to, I need to grow up and challenge myself. Part of that is creating the kind of relationships I can with friends that I, that I would have with my mom. And to, in a, chance, in a sense, challenge my own sense of insecurity to be as secure as I could be around my mom with my friends. Um, so, you know, it's just, um, yeah, about, think of it in that way. If you're protecting yourself, then it's not a need. Now, and, and again, you may not know until afterwards. Like, like the guy, right? Like, like the, <clears throat> the guy who, who identified his girlfriend's body. He may not have known. If he didn't decide to do that, he may not have known until afterwards. That's okay. That's how you build intuition. That's how you get a better sense of doing this. And, you know, we may experience this. Let's say your friends want you to go out and, you know, hang out and party. And you're like, no, I, I'm, you know, I'm listening to this guy on YouTube. I'm going to look at my own needs. And, and my need right now, I don't really feel like going out. I, I just want to stay in. But then you stay in and watch Netflix until 4 a.m. and realize, oh, I... I didn't really want to stay in. I was just avoiding my friends because that was more of a challenge because there are these situations. Oh, you know, my friend, there's this issue between me and my friend, let's say, and I, I don't want to deal with that. I don't even want to be in a situation where I could potentially deal with that. So I'm just going to turn away from that. That's what I was really doing. Okay, now I have a better idea, but it could work the opposite way. I want to, my need is to go out with my friends. And then once you're out with your friends, you realize, oh man, what I really should be doing is studying for this or working on this paper. So if you don't know what your need is, just make a decision and learn the most you can from the decision. Life is not a combination lock. You don't have to figure out the exact right things to do. It's, it's about putting yourself in the best possible situation so you can make a better decision in the future. Do not make good decisions. Get good at making decisions. There's lots of, way to say, lots of ways to say this. So there, there's no uh, way I, I can make the, the differentiation of your needs easy and, and simple. All I can do is give you a process, like the scientific method. That, that there's, nobody can come and tell you what's true or what facts are and what facts we thought were true aren't true. We don't have that, right? We don't have omniscience. But we have a process. We have a scientific method. We have an inductive, in a sense, method to go through to figure out what is true, what are helpful theories, what, what are theories that correspond to reality, and what are theories that simply cohered to our previous schema, let's say, our paradigm. Is that a word from 1998? Same thing with working through the, uh, these issues and figuring out what your needs are. I can't tell you what your needs are exactly. I can give you a process to do it. And I can kind of give you some guidelines, like the scientific method is, is guidelines. If you're avoiding pain, if you're avoiding something, then you're probably not your need. It's just what you want to be your need. It's what's comforting to you. That's in effect uh, distancing yourself from what your needs really are. Ask me more questions about this. I, I mean, please. I, I need to know. I need to know where you guys are with this, like what you're struggling with. That that helps me. Hopefully it helps you, but it helps me as well. So ask me, nms at animusempire.com. And then we have one more question here. Um, what's the epistemological difference between people who are afraid of COVID versus the vaccine? So again, our cultural split in America, probably even the West. 
is aggravated here because of COVID. Because on, on the one side, we have people who are afraid of the vaccine. Like, like I know your views on abortion, on church, on, uh, on guns, on, uh, yeah, on fashion, just by knowing what you care most about or what you're the most afraid of with COVID. Are you most afraid of Pfizer pushing out this vaccine and putting tracking, uh, you know, things in us or little trackers? I don't I'm, uh, my mind's blanking. Or are you afraid of the, the disease? Are you afraid of COVID? Are you walking around with like a, a mask and the face shield and everything? I, I know what your beliefs are on pretty much everything. I know where you shop for groceries based on how you view uh, COVID or what you're most afraid of. Now, we can chalk this up to tribalism, which I think that's part of it. But I think another part of it is, is you know, we have these two different cultures in America. And really what it is is two different epistemologies. We have just two different ways of seeing the world. Go read Leonard Peikoff's Dim Hypothesis for a good uh, rundown of this. We have uh, disintegration. Uh, empiricism, materialism, facts without ideas, and we have misintegration, um, r rationalism, religionism, we have ideas without facts. So we can have facts without, um, we, we can have reality without ideas, or we can have ideas without reality. And that, so that's the, the cultural split in America on a philosophical level. But how is this relate with our different views on COVID. Well, I don't think there's an, an epistemological difference here. Maybe this listener sees it differently, but what I see is primarily a, a metaphysical difference. It's, it's not so much the epistemology, it's where we're placing our authority. On the one side, you have in the left, whose authority is the state. And then on the other side, you have the right, whose authority is God. So you just have people being afraid of different things. You know, we're doing this Bayesian prediction thing with everything. And if you're coming from the state as the authority, right, we got rid of religion. Now religion is the new authority, um, the unconscious self, this discovery of the unconscious. Man, I always forget the name of that book. The Jung's, is it the unconscious? No, it's this, no. Man, I, I've read it a bunch of times. It's, it's the Jungian... I, I consider it the greatest political treatise of the 20th century. It's the discovery of the unconscious. Oh, God. I'm going to go over there and look at it, and I'm going to um, hit myself after this. But So I, I think we, there, there's a difference in what we see as authority and what we put our faith in, so to speak, as opposed to, you know, what I would put my faith in, what my higher power is, what my God is. It's not the state or God. It's reality. And... My reality tells me, my, my relationship with reality from what I can tell, from what's going on, is, yeah, there's some reason to be concerned about COVID. If you're healthy and relatively young, there isn't. But everybody else, you probably could be a little bit concerned and do things to protect yourself. At the same time, if a vaccine comes out, it's probably going to be fine. I don't know too much about it, but it'll probably be fine. So there's like, both are right in their own way to some degree. Um, but again, you see what we talked about last week, like why are we, in a sense, sacrificing the young to the elderly? Why are we doing the thing that the Aztecs did? Why are we having this human sacrifice that is shutting down the economy? Because we're afraid. And we're afraid because we know ultimately we only have faith if we believe in the state or we believe in God. We don't really have a healthy connection with reality to see what the facts are truly are, so we can have a measured response to COVID, which explains why paper towel uh, residue detritus is rubbing off on my bacon. Um, but yeah, but just notice this. I mean, notice that both of these are wrong, right? The left and the right, they're both wrong. Uh, but whichever one ends up being more right, turns out to be more right, then they're going to say it's because of their epistemology, or no, not their epistemology, uh, their metaphysics where they put the ultimate authority, you know, their, their psychological, philosophical authority. And then they're going to use that to, uh, yeah, use that epistemology, use that metaphysics to make a d decision in the future. They're going to think they're right because of their metaphysics, when really they're right by accident. Uh, and then they're going to claim that they're right. 
and then the other side is going to be right to claim that they were only right for the wrong reasons and we're never going to speak to the issue and this explains the cultural divide we cannot balkanize fast enough it's fine it's uh you know <laughs> i mean it's, it's like a power grid right we, we wouldn't have one power station for, for everybody in america unless we had uh, superconductors really awesome superconductors that you didn't have any loss of energy throughout the wires or throughout the transmission of the energy but we do so we have multiple power stations we wouldn't just have one power station why wouldn't we have one government <laughs> this huge land for the people who live in california and alabama it's, it's two different cultures what are we doing and then of course we need somebody loud and i'm not criticizing uh, trump for being loud obnoxious but of course we would need somebody like that to get the the message through of course we would vote for somebody like that um just because it has a lot of power has a lot of energy doesn't mean the ideas are, are necessarily good or, or helpful right um and i think that's what we're doing like you just split up the power grid like, come on <laughs> just, just because we're from two different power grids doesn't mean we're going to be mortal enemies anyway um and then once the power grid split up, we can come up with a better power source. You can come up with a better way to relate as long as it, and it's going to be more likely to happen when we're less beholden to each other. That is going into uh, cultural commentary. So that would be opinion, not fact. Like when, when I talk about uh, psychology. So I'll leave it there. Thank you guys for watching. Um, please like and subscribe. Yeah, thank you for listening. If you're listening on Spotify, yeah, like and subscribe, tell a friend. More importantly, talk to a friend about what we talk about here. Um, I think that's going to be more helpful. Do what you can to reach out and connect. Thank you, guys. I'll leave it there. And I wish you all the joy and pain that comes from looking at your needs for what they really are.